Another common type of matrix that rears its head in the applied arena is uh, something called a skew symmetric matrix. By definition, a matrix whose transpose equals the negative of the original matrix. So in other words, if I swap the rows and columns of A, that yields the negative of the original matrix. For example, just to make that concrete, if we consider the matrix, let's say A is 0, negative 1, 1, 0. If I take the transpose of A, I then take row 1, for instance, and form column 1 with that. So that would then become 0, negative 1, move on to row 2, and I form column uh, 2 with that. And there we go. A transpose, of course, is the negative of the original matrix. So that is a skew symmetric matrix. When I take the transpose, the elements on the main diagonal don't move, right? They're inert. It stands to reason then those main diagonals have to be zero for a skew symmetric matrix. Another property that's kind of interesting here if it's with a skew symmetric matrix is that if I have two skew symmetric matrices, so I'll just say A is skew symmetric, B is skew symmetric, and if I add them together, that sum is also skew symmetric. So we're assuming that A is skew symmetric, thus by definition A transpose is negative A, and B transpose is negative B because we're assuming also that B is skew symmetric. A plus B, how do I test whether it's skew symmetric? I take the transpose of that new matrix. By pro properties of the transpose that I've already disclosed previously, the transpose essentially applies or distributes linearly across a sum. So in other words, A plus B transpose is equal to A transpose plus B transpose. And by definition, right, if skew symmetric, A transpose is negative A, and B transpose is negative B. So if I factor out a negative one, which I can by properties of matrices here, I get, I've shown now, if you string together all the uh, equalities in the end that A plus B transpose is the negative of A plus B. Thus, uh, A plus B is skew symmetric when both A and B are skew symmetric respectively. So let's conclude our survey then of essential types of matrices. There's one I want to mention here in passing called a sparse matrix. A sparse matrix, as the name implies, is sparsely populated with data. In other words, a sparse matrix contains many zeros. So as you might imagine, um, it's desirable to work in an application with a sparse matrix or many sparse matrices, as the case may be, because the more zeros we have, the less work or the less computation we have to do to solve a problem. So that's the idea of a sparse matrix. Now there are two other types of matrices I just want to mention here at the end. Uh, there's something called an idempotent matrix. So an idempotent matrix is a matrix, let's call it A, such that when I square A, I get back to itself. So A squared is A. Now you might encounter an idempotent matrix that's actually very common in doing linear regression, which I mentioned before. So when you're solving this famous problem called the least square regression problem, or minimizing least squared error, it's said, it's oftentimes that you uh, encounter an idempotent matrix in doing that calculation, among other places. So let's just look at a quick example of an idempotent matrix. So the matrix 1, 1, 0, 0, okay, you can think of that as A. If I square it, let's see what our result is here by matrix multiplication. So once again, we perform just a sequence of dot products. So 1, 1 dotted with 1, 0, sure enough, results in a 1. 1, 1 dotted with 1, 0, again, is 1. And when I take the uh, second row here in the left matrix, 0, 0 dotted with anything is going to result in 0. So yes, sure enough, we have A squared equals A for that particular matrix. So A there is idempotent. One other type of matrix to mention here is something called a nilpotent matrix. So a nilpotent matrix, similar sort of sounding. The nil should remind you kind of right in the Latin of zero. So a nilpotent matrix is any matrix so that when I take it, raise it to some power, I get now this is the shorthand for the zero matrix where M is greater than 
or equal to 1. So it's an example of a nilpotent matrix. Um, well, for instance, let's consider the matrix A here, 0, 1, 0, 0, okay? So let's see, when I square this matrix, let's try that. We go 0, 1, 0, 0 times itself, times 0, 1, 0, 0. Again, I perform a sequence of dot products for matrix multiplication. The result here is going to be 0, 1 dotted with 0 column is 0. 0, 1 dotted with the second column is 0. And I move on, of course, to the 0, all 0, 0, and I get 0. So indeed, that particular matrix, 0, 1, 0, 0, is a nil potent matrix. Actually, this illustrates an essential idea in linear algebra where the algebra is vastly different from algebraic equations that we're used to. In other words, what happened here is I multiplied a matrix times itself, A, and I got zero, but that matrix was not zero itself. So in other words, I have A times A equals zero. Now, if you're familiar with something like in basic algebra, right, um, if I have real numbers, let's just say A times B, and they multiply together to give me zero, I can use something called the zero product principle to, do, to deduce then that either A is zero or B is zero, okay? But importantly, that zero product principle fails when it comes to matrices in linear algebra. I've got a counterexample right here, in fact, in hand. When I multiply A times A, neither A matrix was the zero matrix, but nonetheless, their product resulted in the zero matrix. So what that means is the zero product principle fails in general in, in linear algebra for matrices. So that makes it a little bit more complicated, in other words, to solve matrix equations.